that we want to tell you. We also feel like that um, the kind of cultural atmospheric assault on science is ending finally. And that the pendulum is swinging, yeah, the pendulum is swinging back our way. And we want to torque the zeitgeist in the direction of not only exploration and reason and the love of nature, but also for a vision of the future we can still have. It's within our grasp. And that's what Cosmos is about. What happens when your brain and your heart and your soul and your eye and your ear are all fully functioning? And so it's time to get going again. It, it looks like you finally got what you wanted when you were a little boy. That looks, what is the craft that you're traveling with? What is that device? How does that serve the show? Yeah, well, in any storytelling, it helps to have uh, certainly a, a, a figurative vehicle, but here we have a figurative and literary vehicle to move through space and time, and it's the spaceship of the imagination. That's the space you saw me in as I was gesturing. Uh, it's designed to not only move in space, and that's visible through the panoramic portals, but if you want to go into the future, that view opens up above, and then we go to wherever the storytelling requires. If you want to go into the past, the center, central uh, uh, circle below my feet opens up and we travel into the past. And, that's, and that ship expresses anything that I'm thinking at the moment. So there are no buttons, there's, it's just, I'm talking to you about the past, the past appears right when I need it to be, right where we need to go. And that allows us a vehicle to, it allows you a place to return, to transition from one place to another, from one time to another. And yeah, that's cool. I want one. Yeah. <laughs> um, time has moved on, obviously, since the first series, as have uh, the advances that we have in special effects, in telling stories in that way, things that we can't actually film, that we can imagine or we know out there, but we can't get our cameras near. Um, I imagine you're going to use those. But there's also animation, as well as computer-generated, more traditional animation. Why, what was that decision, and uh, was that Seth's idea, and, and how does that yeah, serve the show? Okay. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Seth MacFarlane had the brilliant notion to, instead of, uh, there are stories being told about the heroes of science. You know, the show is not only about our place in the universe, but how we got to know the things that we know. So like the original series, there are stories about scientists, but instead of doing them as live action, we're doing them with kind of what we think is really cool, kind of graphic novel uh, animation that Seth's animation studio is doing for us. You saw some glimpses of it there. You, uh, you mentioned and uh, you used the word zeitgeist and that's a, a fabulous word and obviously we hope this will have that. Well, it's used twerking the zeitgeist. <laughs> that's the most awesome pair of words I've heard. <laughs> if you're going to twerk something, let it be the zeitgeist. <laughs> you know it, girlfriend. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is a cosmos meets drag race right here. Um, uh, but uh, uh, do, you, do you feel that uh, the world is ready for this, or is there an element in which you've had to simplify the message? Is there, to use the unpleasant phrase, is there any dumbing down that's happened in this, or are you prepared to actually make the audience work a little bit to keep up? How do you deal with these kind of concepts, these, this level of, of science, uh, well, but still reach a broad audience? Carl Sagan taught me respect for the audience, for the public, and that there's no need to dumb anything down. Just speak clearly. Just use the words that we all use to depict the grandeur of nature. So Cosmos, the original series and this series are exactly on the same level, which is we speak to everyone, and there are different ways to experience it, but there's no, there's no limitation, there's no exclusion. This, the information that we are we wanting to share with the world belongs to all of us. And in the, great, in the tradition of what Carl did, what we want to do, as he said, when you're in love, you want to tell the world. And that doesn't require any kind of jargon, any kind of technical language. And so um, I, I think that 
this cosmos is as accessible as the first one and contains information at times arcane, at other times, um, you know, less complicated, but it's for everybody. You know, you mentioned uh, the period before the leading up to this, the pendulum swinging back, and it had, it seemed to have swung away from science and from rational thought and discussion. And there was, a, the, the media in particular seemed to enjoy reporting pseudoscience and exactly. mumbo jumbo more. And that was despite the incredible work that you and Carl and others have carried on for. Why do you think that was? Why did it swing away? And, and, and how do we make sure that it doesn't keep going back in that direction? Well, it, it's a kind of failure of nerve. We made such great leaps forward uh, in the 60s, a kind of opening up of our identification horizons, a kind of opening up of our, our, our exploratory courage to get going and to know the universe. There was a kind of audacity and confidence. And we've had a failure of confidence. And part of that has been a retreat into fear, into ignorance, superstition, a kind of magical thinking. I think that you know culturally, it's there's a kind of uh, um, you know a kind of rhythm, and that these there are cycles in which people are willing to open themselves up and move forward, and times when we withdraw. If you look at, for instance, the um, what happened when we were just going around in orbit in the shuttle, it was as if we were the toddlers who had you know made a little foray away away from our mother's legs, and then suddenly realized that we were out too far and came back. I think we're ready to get going again. That's the message of Cosmos. There's something in the air which says that we want to want to um, do the things we need to do to protect our environment and protect this planet for the life that follows us. And part of that is a sense of reality about nature and where we are, when we are, and who we are. And you can't do that without science. You don't get off this planet without science. You don't get anywhere. You don't see this vision of the universe and come to know what other galaxies and other parts of the universe are like without science. Science, the method of science, these are the keys to the kingdom. And I think we're ready to get going and to move forward. I doubt we could find a, a better guide, a better host uh, than Dr. Neil. And that's, uh, and that's Brian Cox is available. Uh, <laughs> just a joke. <laughs> You've forgotten more than he knows, we all know. Um, what would Carl, you, you both knew Carl, obviously, and very well, but what would Carl have made of this new series? What would he have particularly enjoyed about what you have accomplished with this new series? Well, I think. I, he might have done it a second time. I mean, he, he died prematurely, and uh, I would have been happy to like stay home and watch him <laughs> do it. Uh, he's not with us, and but that message has to continue to move forward. And without it, I, I see society regressing. I see, uh, as Ann had said, the pendulum is swinging back in the direction of sort of uh, rational thinking of objective realities. And that's a good sign. I think the ever-growing attendance at Comic-Con is a barometer of this swinging pendulum. And in fact, if you allow me to connect to what might otherwise seem distinct facts, that this period of the 1960s that Anne refers to, of course, we were going to the moon. If you queried anyone in that time, in spite of the trauma that was going on, especially in this nation with the civil rights movement and the hot war and the cold war, people were nonetheless thinking about a future, we were thinking about tomorrow. The World's Fair in New York in 1964, 63, 64, that World's Fair did not create the decade. It was the tomorrow thinking of the decade that created that World's Fair. And that tomorrow thinking, not everyone thinks about tomorrow. And so you want more people of that kind walking among you. And I can tell you that if the people of Comic-Con, the attendees, ruled the world, then tomorrow would be invented every day. Right? And, 
And warfare, warfare would be nothing more than bar fights with toy lightsabers. That would be, that, that's the world. Uh, so, so, what Cosmos does, especially given the, the, the access to the methods and tools of modern storytelling, not only the animations, but the special effects and the visualizations and, and the, 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 the fact that the production team is, is partly assembled from people who professionally make movies. So these are people who know how to tell stories on a big screen are now brought to bear on telling a story of the universe itself and our place within it. And so uh, this is the right combination of the right people at the right time to get, us, get, to, to get everything back on track. 1980, Carl Sagan, that was a generation ago. And um, you don't want to go more than a generation without having to, to reboot that story of who we are and where we're headed in this universe. We can open uh, the floor to question. Before we do, Anne, you know, we're talking about the narrative here that you're dealing with. and uh, You lose something, but you gain so much more. How much more meaningful it is, first of all, to be a part of a continuity of life on this world that stretches back 3.7 billion years, or to be part of cosmic evolution, which stretches yeah, back is a hugger. Okay. <laughs> so uh, let's have the first question, please. Oh um, hi, I'm Julia. And can I just say, um, you guys are all amazing. Like, just being in the same room with you is kind of making me shake and seeing that trailer baby. So this is so exciting. Um, but I have a question for Dr. DeGrasse Tyson. Um, I'm currently. I'm Neil to you. <laughs> <laughs> but if I went around always calling myself doctor, that would mean you'd have to believe what I said because of my authority. But in fact, if what I say is fundamentally true and you understand why it's true, you never have to reference title again. <laughs> studying astrophysics and philosophy, and because of that, I find you to be a personal hero, and I actually got to do some work with Professor Craig Wheeler at UT, um, who told me he had a bit to, you, to do with your graduate degree. <laughs> so I was wondering if you had any advice for budding astrophysicists. Okay. Um. Uh, that would be uh, UT Austin, because UT is also University of Tennessee, yeah. just to clarify. There are many Tennesseans in the audience. Uh, well, four of them in the back row. Uh, so, and they're together, notice. So, the, I, I think when you study a topic and you're basically giving your life to a, a single field, a single topic. When you go to graduate school, you're basically foregoing personal hygiene, you know, to, <laughs> to you know, friendships, love, you know, there, you can, but what, there's always some competition there, the conflict between where you're gonna spend your time. And just consider that uh, you should, what should it attract you to this is not the prospect that one day you'll make a discovery, of course, science, as it is communicated to the public, typically is through the lens of discovery. But in fact, science is a process. Science is what you do in the lab. Science is the wiring of your brain and how you look at the world because of that wiring. It's not the result, it's not just a, an answer, it is a process. And you need to learn to love the questions themselves. And when you do, the universe is yours.